I thought I'd just read you a scripture which it was just picks up something that I said this morning. You know, I said that true scientists, um, godly men, use the scriptures to actually think God's thoughts after them, like Kepler said. Did you know that Maxwell had written over the Cavendish Laboratories at Cambridge, and it's still there today, had it written in Latin, um, Psalm 111, verse 2, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. And that, if there's ever a verse which sort of encapsulates Kepler's eye thinking, and many of these great scientists, like Faraday and others, that is the one. He is, has done marvellous things which are described in those chapters in Job. Uh, God did them, but he would have us think through those matters and have us, uh, in that sense, to do good science, discovering what he has done in nature. And that, that actually often gives great ideas for innovation in industry today. It's called the whole subject of biomimetics. It's copying nature with a view to using it in engineering. Um, of course, the secularists would never give any glory to God. But a Christian does want to give glory to God. And Stuart Burgess is one of the best examples. He's uh, copied the jaw of the, uh, of the fish for good purposes in what he calls four bar mechanisms. Um, he has looked at the human knee joint and copied that for bearings which he is going to use and has used in the last Olympics. He's going to use it in these Olympics for his wonderful work on uh, Olympic bikes. And he, he gets a lot of his ideas from looking at nature. Drones have been copied from dragonfly flight and that's another area that he has worked in. I myself have worked with the Bombardier Beetle, and I've been amazed at the intricacies of what goes on in nature. The works of the Lord are great, and they are found even in the humble Bombardier Beetle. So when it says, sort out of all them that have pleasure therein, even beetles you can take pleasure in and find amazing things that they do. Just one other verse in Psalm 8, the, which is a wonderful um, creation psalm, which starts off, How excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. It's a, and it goes on to say, When I consider the heavens and the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him. This, of course, is quoted in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, and applied to the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but it's a wonderful statement about creation. But then, in verse 8, it's very easy to miss. But it says here, the fowl of, verse 7, and verse, sorry, verse 8, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. That verse, or the latter part of it, inspired a gentleman by the name of Matthew Fontaine Maury, who was a brilliant astronomer in, on the American continent. So even though I put a whole list of uh, European scientists, we shouldn't forget that there was a rise, even in those early years, of the modern United States as they were sorting themselves out um, through the Civil War and all the terrible things that happened then. But he was an American astronomer, historian, and particularly an oceanographer. And due to his belief in the scriptures and that verse in Psalm 8, 
he realized that there are currents in the seas. And he began to track these currents. And the modern work of oceanography and the importance of knowing why those currents were helped greatly uh, all the, the modern navies and uh, the merchant navies as particularly, so there weren't quite so many disasters at sea. So there you go. I want to talk about the theological importance of creation. And I'm going to go fairly fast through this because I want to have some time for discussion. But I do want you to see that there are some huge developments today and they are within, sadly, the so-called evangelical church. We are moving to liberalism and we need to stand against it, which is one of the reasons why, in truth in science, we've set up um, uh, a regular summer school. It may change to becoming a spring school um, future years, but we're trying to find the right time for this. But uh, we were going to run one last year. We had to go online. We started in 2019. This year, we're running it, government regulations permitting, on the 3rd and 4th of September 2021 this year. Not far away now. And if you want to go, or if you want you no know, students who would like to go, it's £30 for the weekend. If you want to book, go to that website, truthinscience.uk. No org in it. Just truthinscience.uk. That's all you need, truthinscience.uk. It's part of what we uh, call the student initiative that Truth in Science have set up. As I say, it started in 2019. And the whole reason for doing it was because of the increasing influence of evolutionary philosophy in education. Basically, I was just so troubled by what's going on in our universities that I think the Lord sort of really just inspired me with a vision to try and uh, withstand this by growing something small. Okay, but don't worry about it starting small. We just want it to grow as the Lord permits and uh, hope there's room at um, the place where we're having it near Quinta it's not actually Quinter itself, it's Cloverley Hall Christian Centre, it's in Shropshire. And there's room there for 100 students, so we could grow to 100 if people um, are able to come. And we want to withstand the growing influence of evolutionary philosophy and the increasing influence of theistic evolution within the church and the marginalization of biblically based thinking which is going on in the student Christian world. So that is our aim and if you know of others, I've got a few invites here, so I'm gonna put them over here. You please feel free to take them. There's not a lot. I've only got about maybe seven or eight there, maybe 10, but feel free to take one. I'm getting some more sent to me, but. Um, you could go onto the web, uh, truthinscience.uk, and you can find all the details there and the booking form. <laughs> Somebody's taken one already. Well, excellent. Good. In November 9, 1880, Charles Darwin received a request from a young barrister named Dermot. If I am to have the pleasure of reading your books, I must feel that at the end I shall not have lost my faith in the New Testament. My reason in writing to you, therefore, is to ask you to give me a yes or no to the question, do you believe in the New Testament? Darwin replied, exactly 21 years after the publication of The Origin of Species in 1880, he replied, and his reply was very blunt, Dear Sir, I'm sorry to, to, inform, to have to inform you that I do not believe in the Bible as a divine revelation, and therefore not in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. So it's, that letter fetched $197,000 in 2015 when it was auctioned at Bonhams in New York. Terrible testimony, isn't it? I don't believe that Darwin turned to the Lord, although I think there is some evidence that he regretted some of the things that he'd set up. 
But amazingly, he still gave to the South American Missionary Society right till his dying day. But uh, strange twist, isn't there, in these people's lives. But look, listen to this well-known atheist writer speak about Christians. Listen to this. Evolution is unique amongst the sciences because it strikes people on the solar plexus of their faith directly. It strikes them in the idea that they're specially created by God because evolution says you're not. It says that um, there's no special purpose for your life because it's a naturalistic philosophy. We have no more extrinsic purpose than a squirrel or an armadillo. And it says that morality does not come from God. It is an evolved phenomenon. And those are three things that are really hard for humans to accept, particularly if they've been brought up in a religious tradition. So he's gunning at Christians there. And he's saying, if I've got Christian students, it's jolly difficult for them to accept it. Because evolution says you're not specially created. You don't have a purpose. <coughs> like a squirrel or an armadillo. Um, why he chose them, I don't know. But, uh, and then, of course, significantly, he says that morality is an evolved phenomenon. That means we have to withstand the atheism by a robust Christian faith, right? I do not believe for a moment that the theistic evolutionary philosophy, which is the dominant view in evangelical thinking, has that robustness to withstand what we've just heard. They're not afraid of theistic evolution, because after all, the people who, who say they're believers and they're absorbing evolution are basically saying, we'll have both, thank you. And uh, these guys, like Jerry Coyne, I'm not going to be afraid of that. Dawkins has said expressly that the real guys you've got to be worried about are the young earth creation folk. He knows full well that we are holding to a truly biblical point of view. I won't read you all this quote. Christopher Hitchens, who sadly has died now, but he says, let's say the consensus is that our species being the higher primates homo sapiens has been on the plan planet for at least a hundred thousand years that's what he thinks maybe more francis collins who's a well-known theistic evolutionist head of biologos right or leading light in it says maybe a hundred thousand richard dawkins thinks maybe a quarter of a million i'll take a hundred thousand in order to be a christian then you have to believe that for ninety-eight thousand years our species suffered and died most of its children dying in childbirth and so on and so forth and then he says um heaven watches with complete indifference and then 2,000 years ago thinks that's enough of that it's time to intervene and the best way to do this would be by condemning someone to a human sacrifice somewhere in the less literate parts of the middle east now okay he's against us obviously we all know that but do you see what he's saying Look, if you're going to believe that the world's been around, that the universe has been around for all these millions of years, and then the human race appears in the last 100,000, quarter of a million, you know, and then God has left it all that time and then produces a human sacrifice in order to save us. That's the biblical doctrine of rede re redemption that he's gunning at. He says, how can I believe that? So... Just like the Pharisees knew more than the disciples in their day about what Jesus said, even though they didn't believe him, right? We've got the same situation happening today. That those who oppose us and are quite open, you know, we, we hate the gospel. Like Huxley hated the gospel, but he knew full well and understood the doctrine of redemption because he grasped what the Bible actually says, even though he didn't believe it, right? He knew full well that if you destroy creation, you'll destroy this nonsense, he would call it, of the gospel. That was Thomas Huxley, right? Well-known atheist in his day, and of course he had Darwin buried in Westminster Abbey. He was the one behind that. So, friends, if you're going to try and take the old earth view, you're actually messing up the waters, you're muddying the waters for the real battle against atheism. You, you haven't got a strong position. 
remember I said, this is the religion that's believed. Are you trying to absorb that? And many people are. The Bible talks about death and how it came about. That it came about through, as it says in Romans 5 verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Death came from Adam. This is vital that we keep to this position. I'm going to show you in a moment that only just recently Keswick had a well-known theistic evolutionist give what's called the Keswick Lecture, just this last Wednesday. And there was no mention in his lecture of the fact that physical death came as a result of the fall. Why? Because he doesn't believe it. And many in Biologos and the Faraday Institute, which this gentleman is connected with, uh, have made it very clear that they don't believe in a physical fall coming as a result of Adam. And yet the Bible clearly teaches it. One Corinthians, and I'm going here to the New Testament, New Testament doctrines, where the theology flowers. The theology is all there in seed form, of course, in the Old Testament. And I'm the first to, uh, to stress that. Genesis 3.15, I quoted earlier, is the proto-evangel. That's where the gospel is there in a nutshell. The seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head, right? That's the first direct reference to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come to redeem us, to pay the price for our sins. Huxley understood this, right? They didn't believe it, but they knew full well that that's what the Bible teaches. They knew full well that physical death, according to the Bible, came as a result of man's sin. So if we're going to say that death is just spiritual, which is what the Faraday Institute will say, um, uh, that, that, that the death that followed the fall was just a spiritual uh, uh, barrier between us and God, and that physical death was there for millions of years before, then you have effectively destroyed, or undermined at least, the gospel. God said in Genesis 2 verse 17 to Adam, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof thou shalt surely die. Genesis 3, and immediately after the fall, the Lord Jesus, sorry, the Lord God says, although it could be actually a pre-appearance of Christ as he spoke to Adam, but anyway, God meets Adam in the garden and he says, Dust you are, and unto dust, dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. You can't have the word dust, meaning two different things in the same sentence. Exegetically, it obviously won't work. And in an exposition, you've got to keep to the meaning of these words. It clearly means that you are dust physically and you are going to go to dust physically. You can't get away from it. And the theistic evolutionists, the people who believe and perpetrate the idea that God used evolution, cannot get round 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans 5 and Genesis 3.19. This lecture I've just been referring to, it's well, well worth listening to. I do try to listen to those who oppose us, and they have a lot of clout. Professor Bob White is a fellow of the Royal Society. I'm sure he's a very good gentleman in, in the sense of his ordinary living, and he, I'm sure he believes uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm not saying that he doesn't know the Lord. But it's one thing to say that you know the law, but it's quite another to say that I, be, I don't believe exactly what it says in Genesis, which is basically what happens in his talk when you listen to him. And he has a very different view, as I've just been expounding to you, of the fall and biblical history. And theistic evolution, which is espoused by Bob White in that talk, and he's espoused by Dennis Alexander, he's espoused by Francis Collins of Biologos. These men have a huge influence with students right across uh, the US, the UK, and now Europe. And it's a very, very dangerous uh, infiltration of the evangelical world. 
Now, I have to be careful here because I don't want to overstep step. I'm not saying that those who disagree on this are not necessarily believers. That is not my position. And it's not the position of any of the creation organizations that I am linked with. Certainly Answers in Genesis, Creation Ministries International, um, Creation Research, uh, and other groups, they would never say such things. But what we are saying is that there are hidden dangers which can cause shipwreck to young people's faith and even older people's faith. Because once you start imbibing the idea that God used evolution, where are you going to stop saying that the Bible doesn't quite mean what it says? As was said to me, I think it was James said to me just before lunch. It, oh no, it was Tom. Um, you know, where, where are you actually going to say that the Bible really does mean what it say? Are you going to say, well, I'm going to start believing it in Exodus? Well, Exodus is full of huge miracles, which of course are also brought into doubt. The, the wonderful miracle when the Red Sea, whichever branch of the Red Sea it was, I'm never quite sure, I'm not going to pass comment exactly on that just at this moment, but when God parted the Red Sea, it was a wall on either side. So much so that all the nations were talking about it. They believed it, even if people who are liberals today in the evangelical world do not believe it. So when you start, say, oh, well, that didn't happen either. Then you start moving on, and eventually, as was said to me earlier, you're going to end up saying that the Lord Jesus didn't rise from the dead because these things don't happen. So you're actually sowing the seeds of people's, dis the destruction of people's faith in the Lord. Like a set of dominoes, if you get Genesis wrong, they all start falling over until eventually you've lost the lot. So let's look at four key doctrines. The Bible speaks about no death before the fall. The Bible speaks about creation being by God's spoken word. The Bible speaks about Adam being made from dust. And significantly, last but not least, the Bible speaks clearly about the flood being global. I believe that last one is often missed out. Affinity, which is the new word for uh, uh, what used to be called the BEC, British Evangelical Council, produced an article a few years ago where it should never have been in the journal, but it was, which cast doubt on interpreting the rocks as being primarily from the flood and started basically espousing an old earth view, which of course then leads to the gates being open for a full-blown theistic evolutionary worldview. There was a lot of debates in, in the circles that uh, we were writing with, the debates within the FIEC, debates with uh, other people, even Stuart Olliott wrote in, and others, a number of us wrote, but uh, there wasn't really a shift in the position of affinity. People are espousing theistic evolution more and more, and it's become mainstream when, in my view, it's a departure from the word of God. Why? First of all, because of what I said, no death before the fall. The fall is clearly taught, not just in the Old Testament, obviously in Genesis 3, but in the New Testament, the wages of sin is death. Is that physical? Well, it's not just physical. We acknowledge that it was a spiritual separation from God, but it includes physical. Because otherwise, basically, why did Jesus Christ physically die on the cross? If physical death was not the penalty included for sin as well as spiritual death, that is spiritual cutting off from God. The answer is that both were penalties for sin. Man would eventually die, and he did 900 odd years later, whenever, however, we don't know exactly when the fall took place, but the impression you get is that it was only a few months, if that, after creation. But whatever it was, that's not crucial. 900 odd years later, Adam died. And you've got Genesis 5 with that horrible refrain, and he died, and he died. Emphasizing death, 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 death. 
physically as a result of the fall. And it's obvious that spiritual death was there as well because the very first thing that happened was that God said, Adam, where are you? He knew full well where Adam was. But he wanted Adam to admit that he was separated from him. So spiritual death did come in immediately because people tried to say, well, in the day that he sinned, he didn't physically die. Well, of course, we accept that. But spiritually, he did. And spiritual death is actually the beginnings of what becomes eventually physical death anyway. The reason I nearly died in March was because I'm a son of Adam. And some of you are daughters of Adam. We have the sin principle within us, which is going to kill us all. But praise God that Jesus Christ bled and died, that I might not only have new spiritual life, which I have now, but gloriously I know that the day is coming when I will be, yes, absent from the body, present with the Lord, but spiritually there will, that's, not, that's not the final end, is it? The final end is when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible. That day of resurrection, glorious future for the believer, a physical promise. Wow, we could go on. But the gospel is powerful. Now look, there's, when God spoke everything into existence, notice that seven times it says it was good. <clears throat> the first six, it just simply says it was good. Note, interestingly, it doesn't say specifically on the second day when God made the expanse that it was good. And I'm not saying it wasn't good. I'm just saying that he doesn't say specifically it was good. Because in that sense, you don't see it. But it's very real because it is an expanse that God made. Physicists are now beginning to realise that vacuum of space is an entity. It's not emptiness. There is something there. Nobody's quite understood it. The more physicists are looking at the vacuum of space... Actually, Maxwell started off experiments trying to look at the way uh, empty space supposedly was behaving, and he realised that there had to be something there. I won't go down that line. You'll have to listen to my other talks, but there is something there, and it is an entity. God made the expanse empty, what we think is empty space. It's something that God made, and he placed the constellations, the stars, later it says in Genesis 1, um, uh, verse 15, amazingly it says that God placed the stars in the expanse. And I find that just utterly amazing, that, that he says, um, he set them for lights in the firmament, it's in the AV, but it's really the expanse of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. Anyway, when it comes to the light bearers in verse 18, which I've just referred to, it was good, fish and birds, good, land animals, good, everything was good, all good, no death. In fact, God emphasizes it on the seventh time, he says, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. Amazingly, Bob White, whom I've just referred to, on Wednesday when he gave the Keswick lecture says, Lions eat, uh, preying on other creatures, you've got to realise it was good. Huh? Huh? Really? As the lion tears away the antelope, or whatever a deer, whatever it's feeding on, and it's, it claws into a zebra? No. No way was it good. That came after the fall. That's the biblical teaching. That's why it says in Isaiah, whatever your interpretation, I'm not trying to divide you here, whether you think it's spiritual or physical, Isaiah is alluding in Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 65 back to the pre-fall world when he says, the lion shall dwell with the lamb. And the child won't fear to put his hand on the cockatrices, that's the serpent's den. Because if it's literal, some think it is, it's going to be a, a reversal completely. Or even if you think it's metaphorical, right? It's still alluding 
even in that metaphor, back to what happened at the beginning when everything was perfect, right? People differ in their views on these incredible passages in Isaiah. This is what we're up against. The advancing re evolutionary, and it is revolutionary as well, reinterpretation of Genesis. The people we need to watch out for are Tom McLeish, who wrote the book Faith, Wisdom and Science, where he calls the view that I am espousing heresy. He actually uses that word against us. Dennis Alexander, who wrote the book that um, creation and evolution, why you don't have to choose. And we wrote back another book, some of us, saying why you must choose. Francis Collins, I've already referred to him. Yes, I'm not doubting that they have a Christian testimony, but Tim Keller, who's well known, has a huge influence with young people, both sides of the Atlantic, head of Biologos, has written a whole series of articles, if you look on the Biologos website, against the young earth creation view. That's why I will never recommend any of Tim Keller's writings. I'm sorry, but I can't anymore. Even though I've enjoyed his book on idols, which was written very well. And uh, there was another book he wrote called The King's Cross, but I wouldn't publicly recommend Tim Keller because he's written this book which, uh, uh, which is denying the, uh, the historicity of Genesis 1. N.T. Wright has brought confusion into our world. And many people in seminaries are following N.T. Wright. They're also following John Walton, whom I've not put up there. But that's another dangerous writer today. They're close to us, but they're not with us, friends. And we need to put up a standard that biblical thinking must follow what the Puritans, what the Reformers stood for. This is, this is what uh, this sort of, sort of uh, this puts in picture form what I said earlier, where Bob White is trying to explain how it looks good, you know, and he quotes Psalm 104, the lions roar for their prey and seek food from God. And of course he is quoting correctly from Psalm 104. But Psalm 104, yes, is saying that in a post-fall world, lions are provided for with their prey, right? So God has not forgotten us in a post-fall world, but that does not mean that that was always the case before the world. It doesn't say in Psalm 104 that that was good. It just simply says that God knows all the needs of all the creatures. Sorry about the cartoons here, but it says a thousand words. As, as we put pictures up, it can convey things very quickly. Evolution says that death, bloodshed, suffering and disease eventually leads to man's existence. Whereas, of course, we know that the Bible says the reverse, that death came as a result of man's sin. So that which was all, all good now is all not good. There is death in the world. Everything was good at the beginning, but now everything has death in it. Land animals die. Fish and birds die. Light bearers, well, we can't say they die, but they are shaken. And that's the word used of the universe. Something happened at the fall which is suggested, but we can't be sure. It's possible that the flood was also had cosmic proportions. Sometimes people think that the world was shaken by either an impact or it could have just been the Lord himself touched the globe and caused it to have these mighty acts of the waters coming up from under the earth and then the waters shooting up into the sky and then coming down as, uh, uh, as, as it were, as the windows of heaven so both the fall and the flood had a mighty effect on the world and possibly, some people think, 
parts of the solar system. We can't not be sure. We don't know enough. Plants and trees. Specifically, it says that thorns and thistles will start coming up. Right? And they do. Thorns and thistles. Juliet is the gardener of us too. I'm not really much into it. But uh, she'll tell you all about the thorns and the thistles. And those of you who do gardening know full well that if you just leave a patch of land, it will grow thorns and thistles. And that which was originally good in the land and the sea, today we're finding more and more floods, storms, droughts. Yes, we do need to care for the world, but to suggest that we somehow can control the planet is frankly not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God brings these things and sometimes brings them in order to remind us of his authority. It wasn't just to Israel that he brought famines. He brought it to non-Israelite nations. And even the pandemic that we're going through and hopefully coming to the tail end of it here, I believe was brought by the Lord as a shot across our bows to remind us of his authority. And light is now, well, we have light, but we know now the problems of darkness and the dangers. So the doctrine of death affects the preaching of the gospel that I've just been expounding. And let me just bring you this uh, before I move on to the next point. Amazingly, when Jesus died on the cross, there were seven sayings that Jesus made. They are the recorded sayings. I'm not saying that there weren't others, but the Holy Spirit has drawn attention to seven sayings on the cross. It may be that there was only seven. It begins with the God, uh, the Lord Jesus saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then, as he speaks to his mother and John the Apostle, woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother, the care for his mother. Then, the dealings with the thief on the cross, where he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Lord graciously saves this man. The first one plucked from hell itself in the new arrangement, the new covenant, which the Lord himself is making by shedding his own blood on the cross. He says, this one is mine. Satan has to relinquish his grasp as the Lord says, this one I died for. Isn't that lovely? And he says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Amazing that the Lord should have such care for people, even while he is in the midst of going through such agony on the cross. But that's not all. Now we come to the sixth hour. And the son has, he's been on the cross for three hours. And now the sun is at its height and it goes out for three hours. Darkness engulfs the land. We don't know what it was due to. It seems to be um, a flashback to the darkness in Egypt. Something that the Lord brought supernaturally. And the indications are that all the last four sayings were said, one after the other, right at the end of the total of six hours on the cross. In other words, right at the end of the three hours. Because in this second three hours, God is doing something utterly amazing as he takes my own sin, takes the sin of all those who would ever believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he places it on his son. And the Lord cries out in agony, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Fulfilling, of course, Psalm 22, verse 1 but also surely saying exactly what he was experiencing, that he was separated from his father for that short while. 
And in agony, he is taking not just the physical pain, but the enormous spiritual pain of being separated from his father because he is sin at that point. And God the Father turns his back on his own son because he's punishing Christ for Andy McIntosh's sins. And he's enduring in a short space of time what Andy McIntosh would have endured in hell for eternity. Then he says, I thirst. Because earlier he had refused the vinegar and the compound or drug which would have dampened down the pain. But now he says, I, I thirst. And he accepts it. And then he cries out wonderfully. One word in Greek, apparently, tetelesti, done, finished. As he has dealt with our sin, the spiritual death has been dealt with. But because it also involved physical death, he has to go through the next bit, which is to say, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he bows his head. I don't think it's like this, you know, dejected. It's probably, many people think that he bowed his head backwards and said, it is finished into your hands. I commit my spirit. And he separates his spirit from his body. Physical death. Because he controls the moment of his death. Not the Romans, not the Jews. I lay down my life and I take it again. Superb, isn't it? The one person who was in control of everything was the man on the cross. <laughs> it's incredible. He was also, by the way, supporting all the stars in space and all the constellations millions of light years away as he was dying on the cross. You never, he never ceased to be the son of God who was supporting everything by the word of his power. Our Lord is so magnificent that as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the foolishness of God is stronger than the wisdom of man. Even on the cross, Jesus is more powerful than anybody who might dare to say, I've got you. Isn't that marvellous? I love this teaching. That the weakness, the apparent weakness of God is stronger than man. So friends, death is twofold. And Jesus took both aspects of death on the cross. If you believe in theistic evolution, you destroyed the platform of the theology of the cross. That's why I'm so ardent that the view that God used evolution is totally unbiblical and wrong. Despite Bob White being a fellow of the Royal Society. Let's move to the other point, which is creation is God, by God's spoken word. We've already spoken about the God sets in Genesis 1. Here they are listed. God said, let there be light. God said, let there be an expanse or a firmament. I prefer the word expanse, as you can tell. And God said, let the waters be gathered together and the dry land appear. God said, let the earth bring forth grass. God said, let there be lights. God said, let the waters bring forth. And God said, let the earth bring forth um, uh, the, the, the animals. And then it says, God said, let us make man in our image. It's a different set of actions that he's going to do there. Because in this point, the whole trinity is implied. Let us make man in our image. And of course, it shows us that man is not an animal. He's made in the image of God. God said, behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed and so on. 
And it says in the authorised, it was so, or the first one it says, there was light, then it, it was so, it was so, it was so, it was so, 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 so. Now, is that a process? No. And I'll show you why. Because the person speaking, the emphasis on, now we have to be careful here because you don't want to separate the Trinity, which is always the danger when you start speaking like this. But, and it's not three gods. We must never think of it as three gods. But nevertheless, there's three persons of the Trinity. So when God speaks, he speaks and he delights to emphasize his son. That's the only way I can put it. Because in Hebrews chapter 1, it beautifully says that he is the perfect expression of the father. I love the way Hebrews explains it. And you can't really actually work it all out in our finite minds, quite what God is saying here. But verse 3 says, Who, speaking of Christ, by whom he also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power and so on, when he had by himself purged our sins. So he is the express image of God. So if you like, he is the, well... He is the spoken, in fact, it says in, in one of the prophets, he, he constantly is issuing from the Father. That's what it says in Micah, in the original. So Christ is the Word, as it says in John chapter 1, he is the Word, he is the spoken Word of God. So when God speaks, it's Christ, but he that has seen me has seen the Father, right? And when there is an action... I'm not going to say that God the Father can't act independently. I'm sure he could, but God is all-powerful. But there's not three gods, but he delights to operate through the action of his Spirit. We don't see a lot of emphasis on the Spirit because the Spirit is always self-effacing and wanting to glorify Christ. And God the Father wants to glorify Christ, right? So you get in Colossians chapter 1 this incredible set of statements where he says in verse 14, which, uh, verse 16, which I read earlier, verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, by him were all things created, the verse that I quoted earlier. He is before all things, and by him all things consist, verse 17. He is the head of the body, the church, verse 18. Then it says, verse 18 at the end, that in all things, he, who's the he, Christ, might have the preeminence. We have a Christ centered redemption we have a Christ centered creation, we have a Christ centered sustaining of all things it's the delight of God the Father to elevate who? The Son it's the delight of the Holy Spirit in John 14 through to 16 to always elevate Christ so we shouldn't be sort of hankering after worshipping the Spirit independent to the Son he says no, 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 I want you to worship Christ it's not that we don't worship the Holy Spirit, because he is Christ's spirit. We don't have three gods. Now, I'm emphasizing this because now we come to this point about those verses that I just read concerning creation. The agency is the word of God, which is bound up very much with Christ himself. Okay? Now look at the same person who came to this world 2,000 years ago, and what's the conclusion concerning the miracles that they took millions of years to perform? No. No. When Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, spoke a word, what happened? Amazing things happened. Get up and walk. Come out from the tomb. To the storm, be still. How long did it take? It, there was an immediate effect. It's so much so that one person who was praised for his faith said to the Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. And don't bother coming to my home. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. And the Lord was stunned. It's the only way I can put it. I mean, I know he's the son of God, but in his, in his human frame, he was delighted. 
because the faith of this man was so evident. It is God's word which is powerful. And of course, Lazarus coming out of the grave is just amazing, isn't it? He says to a dead man, come from the grave, and out he comes. So much. And you know that when the Lord returns again, how long is it going to take for all the graves to open? It's not going to take a million years, is it? All the graves in John chapter 5, it says, will open. When the trumpet blasts from heaven, you're going to know it if you're there. You're going to see all the graves open just like some of them did. And I think it was a precursor of what's going to happen at the end. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, some of the graves opened. And they saw some of the prophets you know, I thought, what's going on here? It's because dramatic things were being done in high places. And it was a foretaste of what is to come at the end. Anyway, less of that, but I'm just emphasizing to you that when you understand that the agency is the word of God, which is basically, it's God himself, but the, what we see is Christ. And actually, it could well have been Christ himself actually speaking. I'm not going to quite go that far because it does say, and God said. But it's the Trinity, right? And the agency, Colossians 1, emphasizes that by him were all things created, right? So actually, it's Christ. So once you grasp the, the, the Christ is the, 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 the linchpin of redemption, he's the linchpin, it's the only word I can think of to get this point across of creation, he's, he's actually the sustaining power now of creation, right? If he says so, he can make everything collapse. That is the power of Christ. Once you grasp that, and you've elevated Christ in your mind, which is the biblical thing to do, then you come to creation, there is no hint of evolution. Because you've understood the same agent took no time at all to do all these miracles. And it's exactly the same. God speaks. Okay, let's come to the third point, And that's this, that Adam was made from dust. Well, this is very easy to prove. Adam was not made from pre-existing living creatures. Dennis Alexander's idea that he purports to to say that the scriptures are consistent with, in his book, Creation and Evolution, do you have to choose? The idea that God took some, some pre-hominid creature and made him into the Adam and breathed into him and he became a living soul and that there were some other descendants of hominids around as well at the time is frankly unbiblical nonsense. It's not consistent with what the scriptures say. And it's not consistent even with, frankly, common sense when you read the scriptures. I just said earlier, Genesis 3, 19, speaking of death, but now I'm thinking more about the dust. He was made from dust. He wasn't made from pre-existing living cells of some kind. It says God took him made him from the dust. He made him from the ground. Now, it's not true of Eve. Eve wasn't made from the ground. She was made from Adam. And a whole doctrine in 1 Timothy 2 is alluded to when Paul speaks of Adam was first formed, then Eve. How does a theistic evolutionist deal with 1 Timothy 2? The answer is they can't. While we're on this matter of Eve, there isn't a different account in Genesis 2, contrary to what Tim Keller tries to imply. In his book, Reason for God, he tries to say that Genesis 1 is not historical and Genesis 2 is the real historical account. As, this, as though there's some contradiction. No, there isn't. Genesis 1, towards the end, says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And Genesis 2 puts a magnifying glass on Genesis 1. And it says, these are the generations, this is the history. I'll come to that if I have time at the end. It's a Toledoth statement here. This is the history 
of the heavens and the earth. And he's closing off Genesis 1, saying we've been talking about the heavens and the earth and how they were made. Now we're moving on to the detail of how what happened in the creation of man and woman. That's what it's doing. And it's saying, the rib or the side which the Lord had taken from the man, he made he a woman. And as I've said, 1 Timothy 2 verse 13 says, Adam was first formed, then Eve. These verses, particularly Genesis 1, where it says man was made in the image of God, and the fact that Eve was taken from Adam gives us a true understanding of human identity. One of the things that people are crying out for today is, who am I? They don't know who they are. I'll come to that on the third talk. But you've got famous actors saying, I haven't a clue who I am. Famous personalities saying, I, I don't understand what, what, what I'm here for. God says, read my book. And the true identity of gender is here. There's no such thing as multi-genders. You're either male or female. There are some very, very tiny percent where people are born with uh, troubles in their chromosomes and troubles with their private parts. We all know that. But essentially, man is either ma male or female. God said, let us make man in our image. God created man in his own image, male and female created he them. And Genesis 2 7 says that man became a living soul. Man and woman are made in God's image. And it's important here to see that the woman is also made in God's image. It's not that man is made in God's image and the woman is not. That would push woman down. Matthew Henry has a lovely comment on this. Wasn't made out of Adam's feet to be trodden on. Wasn't made from his head to rule over him. Made from his side to be cherished. You might say that that's a bit sort of archaic and cute in the language. But actually he's right. God has deliberately in the way he did things to say that a woman complements the man but isn't to actually take a different take a man's role. Her role is different. Which is therefore shows to us the complementarian view, which is the biblical view of man and woman. Man leads, a woman has her role. She's not to lead. She may have greater gifts than the man, but that doesn't mean she should be in the pulpit. So this egalitarian view which has come in is not based properly on understanding creation. I told you I'd mentioned these people who didn't know who they were. Nicole Kidman. I don't know who I am, or what I am, or where I'm headed. A famous, well, in the time he was a, a reasonably famous politician in, in, in Tony Blair's government in the 1990s. He said recently, his name is Douglas Alexander, the most fundamental question in Western politics today has become, who are we? And he's right, we don't know who we are. Because, you know, we reckon we were identified by Brexit, but we, we don't know who we are as a nation. Because we have left the God of our forefathers. We've lost our identity. Nations are uplifted by their righteousness. Righteousness exalts a nation. And their identity, even though they're sinful, obviously I'm not justifying by any means all that the British Empire did. I think we made a right mess of some things. But nevertheless, a lot of our identity and gos uh, uh, go is, is founded in the gospel and the missionary work which came from this country. People would say, Christian Britain, I'm not saying it was Christian, but they would know that there was a lot of gospel preaching here. We were referring over lunch to the work of Archibald Brown in East London. We were referring to the work of Spurgeon in, in the tabernacle. We were, we, 
we, we've referred earlier to the huge revivals under Whitfield and Wesley, Wesley in the 1700s. But we've lost it all. Man is different to the beast. Man is made in the image of God. And notice that Christ is the express image, it says, of, of God the Father. Now let me just deal briefly with this matter of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because actually a lot of the theistic evolutionary teaching really gets unhinged when they examine who Christ is in his human nature. I quoted Psalm 8, which of course prophetically in Hebrews 2 speaks of Christ. Well, consider for a moment... Is the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, a descendant of an ape according to his human nature? Sounds awful to even say it, doesn't it? But what are the implications if you believe that God used evolution concerning the Lord Jesus Christ? You've got a real problem. Because remember, Christ was the son of Mary by the Holy Spirit. As was supposed, Luke 3, 23, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. I take that to mean that Heli is the father of Mary. So Luke is following Mary's line. And Matthew, though it's not entirely complete, is following the guardianship line of Joseph, right? So you've got two genealogies. People often say they're contradictory. Well, the, the reason they don't agree is because one is following Joseph and the other one's following Mary. And Mary goes, you know, sort of a daughter of Heli. That's what's implied in Luke 3.23. Then it goes to Mathat and so on. It eventually gets to David, then it gets to Abraham, then it gets to Noah. Then it goes even back to Adam. And this is, of course, uh, showing to us the humanity of Christ. Now, in Hebrews 2, it says that God made him a little lower than the angels. Or some versions might have. And the original might justify this, and so I'm not particularly building an argument on the exact translation of the authorised here. And I'm not saying the authorised is right or wrong, but some versions will say that he was made for a little time lower than the angels, right? But whichever view people take, he was made lower than the angels, not lower than man. That's the point. If you're going to say that somehow the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ was indirectly connected, well, actually, you've got to have to say directly connected, because precursors to Adam were animals. What are you going to say about the nature of Christ? You've really got a problem. And no theistic evolutionist that I know of has ever explained what they think of the flesh of Christ. I know I need to finish. I'm being told. Let's deal with the last point, which is this, the flood. So we're dealing with the last point here. The flood was global. The high hills that were under the hell, whole heaven were covered. Does that just mean the local hills? What are you going to do at the edge? You're going to say that the flood sort of just suddenly came to an end? You're going to say, oh, yeah, but there was high mountains that made a base, a basin. In which case, the edge of, the, edge of that area was not covered. In which case, Genesis 7.19 doesn't make sense. Anyway, a local flood doesn't make sense for other reasons. What's the point of building an ark if all you had to do was simply move? And what about afterwards where Genesis 9 says, I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Do you know, I think the devil is really enjoying himself at the moment. Not for long, by the way. But that which typifies the ark and the flood is the rainbow. It's been pinched by the LGBT group as a symbol of their horrible
beliefs. But actually, the rainbow belongs to the ark and the flood. And it speaks of God's wonderful salvation. And God says, whenever you see a rainbow, I will never bring this disaster ever again. What does it mean? That I will never bring a local flood again? How can that be possibly an interpretation? It doesn't fit. Because we've had floods in China where people have been drowning in subway tunnels and subway trains, right? That was a terrible local flood. When Hurricane Katrina came through in about 10 years ago, whenever it was, and came through the Gulf of Mexico and New Orleans and all the area there was underwater, there was a huge number of people died. Not perhaps as many as those who've died in Bangladesh and low-lying areas there where it goes into hundreds of thousands. How can you say that Genesis 9 makes sense with a local flood? It only makes sense when you say there was a global flood and there's never been a global flood ever again. So friends, 2 Peter 3 particularly makes it plain. Where is the promise of his coming? This they willingly are ignorant of the fact that by, or or of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. Then it says, then it speaks of the flood in verses 8 and 9. Then it goes on to say, but the heavens and the earth which are by the same, are now, that's now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. So that which is coming is a judgment by fire. And 2 Peter 3 makes it plain that this is connected with the judgment that came by water in the past. So you cannot have a disbelief, according to 2 Peter 3, in the total worldwide flood because there is coming a total worldwide flood disaster by fire. I do need to deal with one other thing. I want to give you some time for questions, but let me just deal with one last point. Just to say that there are all sorts of things that I could tell you about the flood. Noah, did you know that all the, uh, all the animals, all the dinosaurs, fossils, are all in that curve, in that ellipse? going from the bottom of the United States right up into the northwest in Canada. How did that happen? That all these dinosaurs are all buried in one great big huge area, thousands of miles long. That's clearly speaking of the flood. How did, how in China could you get this exquisite fossil of a turtle with a small Psittacosaurus together. Everything is telling you flood. How can you get such, how can you get fossils like that where you can actually see the, the long arms of, the, uh, of the, the octopus and it looks like a modern octopus. <laughs> it's clearly telling you this is the flood. Everything is telling you this happened to ha- had to happen exceedingly quickly. The flood was global. The scriptures teach it. The science teaches it. And we need to keep to a global worldwide flood and keep to that as a framework in which to look at the science. Answers in Genesis, by the way, has built uh, a wonderful replica of the ark. It's well worth visiting. Juliet and I went on a suitably rainy day in Kentucky and saw it, and it was just brilliant. There's no other word for it. It really is well worth all uh, a visit. Now, see why I am very troubled if I put up these quotes to you. John Stott, before he died, wrote a, a, a revised version of his book, Understanding the Bible, where he said, um, it, it, a, a pre- I see no reason... Or he says, my acceptance of Adam and Eve as historical is not incompatible with my belief that several forms of pre-Adamic hominid may have existed, and so on and so forth, he says there. 
And he then tries to say that Adam was the first homo divinus. So even John Stott went wrong at the end of his life. Um, Francis Collins says, a committed Christian need not fear evolution, but can accept it as God's awesome means of creation. You see why I'm troubled by biologos. Dennis Alexander wrote this book, Creation or Evolution, Why Do You Have to Choose? Um, and he, he says something totally, obviously wrong in this article that he wrote in The Guardian, that wonderful neutral newspaper. Um, uh, some years ago, he said, nowhere does the Bible teach that physical death originates with the sin of Adam. Which Bible is he looking at? Nor that sin is inherited from Adam. It's total nonsense. Clearly does say that. And I don't know how on earth he came to that conclusion. And then um, it gets worse. Um, Peter Enns, who got chucked out of Westminster Seminary, um, quite rightly in my view, says, um, rethink Genesis and Paul. Um, this will help us think synthetically about how Christianity and evolution can be in dialogue. I'm writing this book to present one way of pressing forward that thesis. That I mentioned Tim Keller. This is why I don't agree with Tim Keller. He says, Genesis 1 is a passage whose interpretation is up for debate among Christians. I think Genesis 1 has the earmarks of poetry and is a song about the wonder and meaning of God's creation. Genesis 2 is an account of how it happened. Even Don Carson, whom I really, you know, he's often spoken at major reformed uh, uh, um, uh, conferences. He says, I hold that the Genesis account is a mixed genre. I don't think you're right, Don. That feels like history and really does give us some historical particulars. At the same time, however, it is full of demonstrable symbolism. Sorting out what is symbolic and what is not is very difficult. Don, you're trying to sit on the fence. You're trying to have your cake and eat it. John Walton, uh, please avoid this dangerous idea that somehow, you know, that it's all to do with form and function. It's not to do with a literal interpretation. That's his view. And he tries to say that the only way to understand Genesis is through the eyes of the ancient Near Eastern writings. We need to get back to Leith Samuel, who said this. We, I wish we could have Leith with us today. Because Leith says, when he was reading John 5, he said, We were taught in seminary that Moses could not possibly have written the Pentateuch because there was no writing at the time of Moses. I came in my daily readings to John 5, where we read our Lord saying to his Jewish critics, do not even think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses. It was as if the words I have picked had been put in the Bible specially to help me. The whole question was now lifted to a higher level. Was Jesus Christ my final authority or not? If he was, then he, would, then he who believed Moses wrote would expect me to believe also and I would rather side with him than with all the brilliant theologians in the world. Time won't permit me to do everything else that I wanted to do in this talk but we'll just have to leave it there. But thank you for listening. There may be some questions that you want to draw to my attention. Questions? Yes. Sadly, you're quite right, Mark. I hope you all heard what Mark Mullins was saying there. Yes. I mean, John... Yeah, John was... Re he took issue with Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones in 1966. And I don't think he ever recovered since that point. And Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, I think, was proved right that... Uh, he should have come out of the Church of England. I mean, I was converted 
Uh, and after I'd been converted in 1960, when was I converted? 69, I read John Stott's Basic Christianity. I was greatly helped. That's right. I think he, he moved in his position. And he became more and more friendly with the environmental green lobby as well. Which, I'm not saying all that they say is wrong. Shouldn't pollute stuff, you know, shouldn't put plastic in the sea and all this sort of stuff. But frankly, it's not the biggest concern. Our biggest concern should be the gospel. We're not building the kingdom here. We're looking for a kingdom to come. That's the whole thrust of Hebrews 11. We look for a city whose builder and maker is not man, but God. Other contributions? Feel free. Questions? I'll aim to finish exactly at quarter past. But this is your breather to ask some questions. Did you want to ask anything, James? No, no, I was just uh, sitting there enjoying it. I was drinking it in. Thanks very much. Bless you. Tom, did you want to ask him anything? Where's Daniel? There's Daniel. Got any questions? There's the students here. Is this that's a good point so is this theistic evolution only something that's arisen in modern times or can it be traced back I think it can it's a bit difficult to trace it within a Christian context you can trace the evolution as I did in the first talk back to Greek thinking right now whether there was the makings of Christian absorption and synergy and synthesis or whatever S-Y-N you're going to say in this because that's what's going on. You're merging two philosophies. Um, it's a bit difficult to track. Um, most of the Christians at the time of Darwin were not trying to absorb it. But there were some notable ones which were sitting on the fence, none other than the great B.B. Warfield at Princeton was sitting on the fence as this began, as Darwinism began to take off. So, I mean, don't, please don't think that I'm, how can I not such a great saint? Because I, all I can say is that he was struggling. I think he wobbled. Um, I don't know whether others of you here who know more, like David Kay and Malcolm, might like to say sorry. <laughs> That's an interesting comment. Uh, you're saying that the Masoretic text view mm, might be. I, I've not heard that point made before, so maybe I need to think into that, Mark. And if you've got something which indicates that that is, you know, if you've got something in writing, I'd like to read it. Please do send it to me. Um, so even the great B.B. Warfield, who was no pushover, we're dealing here with a massive intellect who loved the gospel, loved the truth, you know, wrote, the infallib wrote of the infallible, fallibility of scripture strongly. But he was doubtful at least he put doubt on it he just he was hinting that maybe we could absorb it in some way of course Thomas Chalmers up in Scotland is behind the gap theory and that led to a lot of real trouble which affected the brethren in particular and the Schofield Bible reflects the Chalmers view and the gap theory has been passed on as a stepchild to People like John Lennox, who takes the view that you can have not just one gap, but you can have possibly gaps between all these days. You can, you can hear him on record as saying that. So there's a lot of real trouble, which was started, I'm afraid, by Christians wobbling in the 19th century. Um, but, I mean, who am I to blame them? You know, I mean, they did have all the resources that we have today they didn't have the internet they couldn't quickly look up what did such and such say they didn't have access to all the science they thought you know how who am i as a theologian to deal with the science this is why i'm saying to you as essentially theologians 
in seminary, stick to the text. Stick to the scriptures. Believe what God has said. You be the vanguard and let the other scientists work it out later. You know, I'm not saying as a creation believer that I've understood everything that there is. I don't, how, how can I say that I've understood the answer to all the issues like the light question? You know, light, I, clearly these galaxies are more than 6,000 light years away. We don't understand all that God has done. Eventually we might. So there's a lot of areas where we don't know all the answers. But I believe what the word of God says. That's my position. Let me just end with something else just to show you. I just want to show you something else. Because some people don't realize that there is a, um, the days. Let me just show you this about the days of creation. Day one, day two, three, four, five, six, seven. You know what it says in the text. We've been dealing with that earlier, right? It's the word yom, right? Now, are those days 24-hour days? People don't realize that the actual text itself shows us that they are days, 24-hour days. Andrew Steinman even though he believes in gaps in Genesis 5 and 11, and I wish he hadn't written that article. But uh, on this, he's very good, right? If you, so I'm not saying everything that Andrew Steinman says is correct, because I think he's wrong on the genealogies. But on this, I think he's correct, and he knows his Hebrew. In day one, it says evening and morning, one day. It's a cardinal counting statement, right? So if you read it from this end, and was evening, and was morning, day one. He, God is defining a day. Right? It's a definition. It's a cardinal counting statement. These are ordinal. So you've got, and was evening, and was morning, day second. Not day one, not day two. Right? So it was day, day one here, but this one is day second, which means it's ordinal counting. So day third, day fourth, when he made the light bearers. And then we come to uh, day five, a fifth day, just like the other ones. Day six, it's interesting. The sixth day, it is ordinal counting because it's still saying the six, but it's got here apparently in the Hebrew the emphasis on the six. Now, why is it the? Because day six is a very important day, and God is drawing attention to it, saying something really special is going to happen now. Yes, I made the animals, but I made man. And he's in my image. So that's why he says the sixth day. And then day seven uh, is also like day six for a different reason. The seventh, because it's the Sabbath, right? Now, of course, we believe that the Sabbath has now moved to the first day. That's what happened. But uh, we won't just go into that just at the moment. But what Andrew has brought out is the massive detail and the, the so, it's so rich in the original Hebrew, which I don't know. So I have, I'm reliant on those who do, right? I find that just staggering. But um, just in case you're still wondering whether those days could be long periods of time, Genesis is historical literature there is only one verse which possibly has parallelism in it which could speak of poetry, and that is verse 27, where it says, male and female created he them, um, and it says it twice. Um, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. That's the only place where you could possibly argue there is a bit of Hebrew poetry there. And the word used is yom, and it usually means from the context, what it, it usually tells you from the context what it's referring to. And in Genesis 1, the context tells you that 
because it's using evening and morning, and I've just shown you that from the Hebrew, and because it's repeating it first, well, that shouldn't say first day, I've just told you it's day one, so that should really be say day one there, second day and third day and so on. This is clearly showing to you that it's an ordinary 24-hour day. And that which really proves it, to my mind, is Exodus 20, verse 11, where it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. So the Sabbath command, clearly, the context is talking about a week. And it's saying, I made everything in a week or in six days and rested the seventh. So should you. And there's no argument. And when people say, well, how on earth are you going to deal with the light? And, you know, you're going to say they're all made on the fourth day. Then what was the day light before? You don't need to worry about that. Because God does not need the light of the sun to produce light. What was he doing in Matthew 17 when the Lord shone on the Mount of Transfiguration? And why does it say in Revelation that there is no need of the sun there because the Lamb is all the light of that place? That strongly indicates that the earlier light that was being received was either something that God had made specially, or I think it's far more likely that it was actually the Shekinah glory shining on a rotating globe. I can't prove it, but that's what I suspect. So there's a few issues there which I've just tried to deal with at the end. But I think we must finish. I've gone over time now. So let's have 10 minutes break and look at the books, please, while we break. <laughs>